Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me loud and clear? Excellent. So we're going to be doing Postman Fundamentals this morning. But a couple of quick things. Um, if you've been here for a while, you might have seen this slide up on the screen. So basically, there's a couple of things that we're going to need. You need the content for the course, and you can grab that from a GitHub repository on that URL. You also need to sign up for an Open Weather API account. We'll be using that for some of the exercises. When you sign up, it is free. Uh, you get an API key, which you'll need. And if you're wondering about the Wi-Fi, the password is postcon with an exclamation mark at the end. So with Postman Fundamentals, as Sanjeev mentioned, we're going to be going through the basics of the Postman desktop application. So we'll take you beyond using Postman for just sending an API request and looking at the response. We'll also look at how we can organize our requests, how we can use variables, and how we move around the workspa various workspaces and do some basic testing as well. So I'm Johnny. I work primarily as a technical trainer, and I also run training teams. And I've, I helped build this course for Postman. And I, I'm also, I've also built the expert session that we'll be doing in this afternoon as well. And I've worked with other software companies to help build and run their training, including companies like Docker and Nginx. We're going to go for three hours. I'll try and give you guys a break roughly every hour, depending on how we go for time. Or maybe we'll have a break at the halfway point. The format will be I'll present material on these slides. I'll be doing some demonstrations. And of course, there will be practical exercises to work through. How I will run the exercises is when we get to one, I will demonstrate what needs to be done first. So you can, have a, you can observe and see what's required on that exercise. And then I'll give you guys some time to work through the steps. And if you get stuck during those exercises, just put up your hand, either myself, uh, I can come down and help you out, or we have a lot of the Postman uh, staff on board as well who can come around and help you guys out during those exercises. Another handy thing is when you go to that GitHub repo, you'll see that there is an exercise text file here. So there are going to be things that you need to type in, like URLs and uh, JSON strings. Anything that needs to be copied and pasted, you can grab from this text file. So you don't have to worry about typing in or making spelling mistakes, typos, anything like that. So I do highly recommend that you have this file open from the repository. And you can, of course, get a PDF copy of the slides here as well. All right. Of course, you need Postman installed. If you haven't got that, please go and download and install the app, and then the Open Weather API account. So this is the agenda. We'll go through by starting with the Postman concepts and looking at the different elements of the interface. It's important to understand these before we actually dive into the product and look at the features. First thing we'll do is look at creating and sending our API requests. Some of you might have done this already. But we'll also learn how we can organize these requests into what we call collections. We'll look at how we can make use of variables and environments so that we can use the same requests across different settings. And then we'll perform some basic API testing and look at how we can set up additional workspaces and, and collaborate through those workspaces. So to start with, let's talk about the Postman concepts. So our major concepts are our requests, collections, variables, environments, and workspaces. And we'll look at the user interface and the different elements of it. But first of all, can I get a show of hands as to who hasn't used Postman for, before? Anyone who, here who's completely new? So it looks like most people have some experience with the product. All right, so what is Postman? Well, most people that use, have used Postman use a very small set of the features. They use it to send a request to an API and look at the response, and that's pretty much it. But Postman can do a lot more than that. We call it an API development environment, and that's a tool that helps you to manage the development and lifecycle of an API. And we do this, we have a couple of main features.
features. We have a concept called collections, which is one of the main concepts in Postman and everything, a lot of the features that you see in the product are backed by what we call a collection. And then Postman has a set of built-in tools that help you to manage those APIs. So you've got tools for creating mocks, tools for generating the documentation, publishing documentation, running tests, et cetera. And all these tools work together in what we call a workspace, which is like a real-time collaborative environment. So we'll see some of these throughout the training. And this is the API lifecycle that I'm talking about. So your typical API lifecycle, you start with designing and mocking your APIs, you debug it as you implement the API, then you want to set up your automated testing, generate some documentation, monitor that API once you've deployed it, and then, of course, you'll publish the API and make it discoverable for uh, users and developers. And Postman has tools that support every stage of that lifecycle. We'll talk a little bit more about that lifecycle in this afternoon's session. This session here will focus on some of the main features. So the first concept I'll talk about is a request. And a request is simply a sending a HTTP request to an API endpoint to perform some action. We support all of your HTTP methods like get, post, put, delete, etc. And the results of the request are displayed for you in the UI. And you can then save that request if you want to reuse it in the future. And you most probably will want to do that. That's saved into what we call a collection. A collection is just a group of our saved requests at a basic level. It's a group of saved requests, but we can do a lot more than that. And inside a collection, we can further organize these requests into folders. If you have a look at the diagram on the right-hand side, you can see a little structure of that. So you've got a collection inside that, you've got multiple folders, and inside those folders, you can have multiple requests saved into them. Why do we use collections? There's a couple of main reasons. At a simple level, we use it to organize things. So you wanna group your requests into some sort of structured way so that when you reuse them, you can easily find those requests. And that also helps with documentation because when you use Postman to generate your API documentation, that is based on the collection that you have created. At a more advanced level, you can use collections to run test suites, and you can also set up things like conditional workflows where the result of one request can be used as input on a subsequent request. Um, in this session, we'll mainly look at organization in terms of what we do with our collection. In the afternoon session, we'll explore documentation, test suites, and workflows. The next concept is variables. Now, most people who come from a programming background know about how variables are used, and Postman is no different in that regard. We use variables to allow us to reuse values and avoid repetition. So you can change the value of that variable in one place. If you look at this screen here, at the bottom we specify a URL, but at the beginning, instead of saying what the actual domain is, I've just put a variable there saying server URL. The value of that server URL can then be determined um, based on what I configure for that variable. And you can use variables in your request builder and in the scripts that you write. These values can be defined in a number of different places. We can define them globally, uh, in a collection, or in an environment. And that means we can configure different environments for the same request. Speaking of environments, that's the next concept here. So you'll see, actually, if I just go back one, see at the top there, no environment selected. But in this screen, I've selected an environment called staging. And within that environment, I will define a value for that server URL variable. So an environment is basically a set of key value pairs, and each key represents a variable that we can use somewhere in our requests. So the server URL variable is used in my request URL. And this allows us to easily switch between our setups without having to change a request. This environment's called staging, so I might have a staging server for this application, and the server URL for that staging server is defined in my staging environment. If I want to switch to sending requests from the staging environment to a production environment, I don't have to go and 
create another request and, and change the URL on that request. I stick to the same request, and I simply select a different environment on this drop-down list. So you can easily switch between your setups without having to change a request. And finally, we have an API feature. And Postman's API feature allows you to design and develop APIs within um, your workspace. You can define or import an API a schema. It gives you version control features on that API schema. And you can then go and generate collections from an API, or you can, if you've already got collections that are set up, you can link those collections to an API version. Uh, we won't be looking at the API feature in this session. We're primarily going to be focusing on our requests, collections, and our environments. Now, all of these things work together in an environment or in a real time collaborative environment that we call workspaces. And a workspace is a view of our collections, our environments, etc. They give us another layer for organizing our work. We have two different types of workspaces, team and personal workspaces. We'll talk about the differences when we get to the workspace module towards the end of the session. And your collections that you set up, you can share them across workspaces. And this helps us with collaboration. As a quick example, if I switch into Postman, I have a workspace specifically for this session called the Fundamentals Workshop. You can see it's currently empty. I don't have any collections in here. There's no history of any requests. If I switch to the Postman Expert Reference Workspace, for example, I have a number of collections set up here. So this is a way for us to organize different sets of work. All right, so those are the main concepts of the product. Now let's take a look at the different elements of the user interface. So we can, we can break down the UI into basically four different sections. You have your request builder, which is where you define the details of a request that you want to send. There's the header, which gives us a set of navigation uh, tools and to create new things like new documentation, new mocks, et cetera, and also to switch between your workspaces. The sidebar is where you can find your list of collections, your request history, and your list of APIs. And then you have the response viewer, which is where you see the results of any requests that you have sent. So that's the request builder. You have all the elements needed to build a request. And then the sidebar, which is your history of previous requests. You can collapse and expand that sidebar as well. And so that's a quick review of the module that we've gone through. So our requests are used to test our API endpoints. We organize them into collections. And we use variables and environments to help us reuse values. And our main UI elements are your request builder, sidebar, the, the header at the top, and also your response viewer as well. Any questions before we jump into the second module? Nope. All good? OK, so let's look at how to create requests. We'll be creating both a GET request, POST request, and also looking at how we can import API authorization credentials. So creating a request is fairly straightforward. You select your HTTP method, put in your request URL, and send it. Depending on the type of request, you might need to edit the request body, add some headers and parameters as well. Now with headers and parameters, you have the ability to, let's start with parameters. So you can define your parameters directly on the query string. So you can see there, question mark, first name equals to Sally, that's a param. Or you can use this params editor here and specify the key and value. Both of these are interchangeable. So if I define the parameters in the key value editor there, it automatically populates the query string for me and vice versa. You've also got a tab there to enter your HTTP request headers if needed. And there are temporary headers which are automatically generated for every request. 
The response is then displayed in the response viewer, and the, res the body of the response can be displayed in different formats. So you can choose HTML, you can choose to format into JSON if you're, getting, if you're expecting a JSON response. You've got a find feature on the right-hand side there if you want to search for a specific string of text within your response. And if you get a, or if you're getting a HTML response, you can also render that HTML response by using the preview tab. Um, so you can sort of see what it looks like, although it won't render exactly as it would on a typical web browser. And that brings us to our very first exercise, where we'll simply create a GET request and have a look at the responses and navigate around that viewer. So the request I'm going to make. If you go to the, your exercise text page, is to this URL. So I'm going to put that in there. It is a sample API called RESTful Booker. It's available. Um, it's hosted and available, that you, and you can, you can have a play around with it. So I'm simply going to make that request here. And if I switch to these tabs like headers, you can see you can define the headers um, if you need to define any um, additional HTTP headers for your requests. But I'm simply going to hit send to get the response. And when I hit send, you'll notice how it generates these temporary headers. So your standard headers like user agent, accept, cache control, et cetera. And the response is displayed here. In this case, we get a list of booking IDs. This API kind of simulates making hotel bookings. So we have a list of this in JSON, and you can see that it has automatically selected JSON as the, as the formatting for my response. So that's one. And the other one that we'll send a request to is just Postman. This time we get a HTML response. So I can preview this. And that's a a preview of what the page might look like. And as you can see, it doesn't look exactly like it is on a web browser. And there's the search feature on the right-hand side there. So you can go and find a specific string if you, need, if you need to. Also on the response viewer, you can see the status of the response. So there's the 200 response code, response time and size. And then if you, have any, if you get any cookies, they are displayed here. And then there's the response headers. There's also a test results tab. We'll see that in action a little bit later on. So that is exercise 2.1. If anyone has any questions there or if you need any help, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll give a minute or so, and then we'll continue on. This is a fairly easy way to get started. All right, everyone good to continue? All right, if at any time you need, you, you need a bit more time, please don't be shy, just let me know. All right, so that was a GET request. What about POST requests? For POST requests, we often have to define some data that we want to send to the API, and that's defined in the request body. You can define form data, raw text, JSON, XML, and you also want to set the content type header to indicate the type of content that you're sending to the server. 
But Postman can do that for you in a lot of cases. It can recognize what content you have in the body and automatically define the header. So let's take a look at the next exercise where we send a post request. We're going to keep the same URL, so that restful booker um, Heroku app dot com slash booking URL. We'll keep that, but we'll simply change the method to post. And then we're going to define the request body. Now, the body that we're going to send is this large JSON string on the right-hand side of the slide here. And of course, we can copy and paste that from our exercise file. So I'm going to copy from there. So let's switch back to, uh, I need to get the URL first. Put that in there. And then I will click on body. And you can see on the body tab, we have a number of different options. You've got form data, um, raw form unenco uh, encoded. You can have binary data where you can upload a file. You can also use GraphQL as well. But we're going to use the raw option. So tick the raw option there. And then grab that JSON string. and paste it in. Now, the other thing you need to do here is see where it says text on the right-hand side? So we want to select the type of content that we are sending. And in this case, it is JSON. So I choose that. And when you choose that, if you just also go to the headers, you also see that Postman has automatically populated the content type header. So content type, value, application, slash JSON. So when you select JSON from that dropdown, it automatically adds that header in. Oh, and of course, change the request method from get to post. Hit send. And on your response, what you should get is a, a booking ID for the new booking that we have just created. So I'm looking at number 29 there. So that's the the first half. Now, the second half is we've created that booking. Let's make sure it, it's actually in the system now. So we're going to go and search for it. And we're going to go back to a get request. But this time, we're going to open our key value editor and put in a parameter of first name and looking for a value of Sally. And the reason for that is because when we created that booking, you can see there, we inserted a booking for someone called Sally. And so that's what I want to look for. So let's go back to get request, and I can go to params. And you can see as I'm typing in the key, it's automatically populating the query string on my URL. So send that. And now we'll get a whole bunch of booking IDs, because every one of you is creating a booking for Sally, and so therefore, there's a ton of these IDs in there. But you should be able to find the ID number that you had previously. So I had number 29, I believe, and somewhere in here. Probably just missing it somewhere. But if you find the booking ID, um, you've, created, you've done that first step correctly. Also, I should note that. This API that's hosted, it resets every 10 minutes. So it could happen that you create it, and then it resets, and you, you lose the data that you've just created. So that's exercise 2.2. There's two, there's two slides for that exercise. If you need me to switch which one is on display, let me know. Otherwise, there's the PDF copy of the slides from the GitHub repo. So you can have a look at the steps there on your own screen as well. And of course, if you have questions, please put up your hand and let me know. Good to continue? OK. Now, there's a, there's a send and download feature as well. So that's useful if your API service returns a response that is not JSON or HTML or text. Like, say, for example, you're expecting an image file or an audio and video file. We can't really display that on the response viewer. And so you would use the send and download option. And that allows you to save the response to a file. So that's just on the drop down here, send and download. 
You can also generate code snippets from, based on your requests. And that's very useful if, in, in helping us with our application development. So you've sent the API requests. You've verified the response. You know that it works correctly. Now we want our application to send that same API request. Rather than writing the code from scratch, we can just generate the snippet. So there's support for over 15 uh, languages and various libraries for certain languages. So if you just look at underneath the send button, there's a code option here. And the code snippet will be based on exactly how you've configured the request. So let me say, let's make that a post request again. So I've got my post request with the body. And if I hit code, you can see it puts in the body for me. And this is, this is the Java library, but you can see I can switch to any of these other languages. And some languages like Java will have multiple library options. And you just copy that and put it into your, your application code. So that was the code snippet demo. Now, most APIs won't allow you to simply, oh, yes? The code snippets? OK, sure. So just going through the code snippet again. So if you look underneath the send button, there's that link that says code, and if you click on that, and then on the drop down, you select the programming language you want, and some of them have multiple library options as well. And you can then just copy, the, copy that snippet and put it into your application code. Right, so most APIs won't let you just send requests to it without some sort of authentication or authorization credentials, especially production APIs. You need to supply some sort of credentials so that the API can determine whether you are allowed to access it and what resources you can actually access. Now, the Postman application has what we call authorization helpers to simplify the process of supplying your API credentials. So there are many authentication methods that are supported by these helpers, like you've got OAuth, basic authentication, bearer tokens. If you want to send requests to the AWS API, for example, you've got your AWS signature and many more options as well. This is a screenshot with a list of those options. And if you want to get more details about each individual option, there is a documentation page there. Now, the credentials that you specify from the authorization helper are converted into a temporary request header. Usually it's like the, the authorization header, and then the value would depend on what method you're using. For example, if I'm using a bearer token, then the value would be bearer, followed by whatever the token is that I specify. Uh, these, these temporary headers aren't saved in the request, so it doesn't expose your credentials. And some APIs require a custom authorization header or a query string parameter, which you need to um, specify. So for example, the Postman API, if you want to send requests to the Postman API itself, you either need to put in a query string of API key at the end and followed by whatever your key is, or you can use this X API key um, header. So for this exercise, we are going to use the Open Weather API. Hopefully, you've all registered for the Open Weather API account, um, either at the beginning of the session or before today. In your account, you'll find an API key, uh, or on your registration email, you should get that key in there as well. So what we'll do, and before I demonstrate that, I'll show you the authorization headers. So let's start a new tab for a new request. And if you go to authorization here, you can see the different types of uh, authorization options. So if you want to specify a bearer token, you select that. If you want to specify AWS, AWS signatures, you've got your access key, secret key, et cetera. For OAuth, there's your OAuth access token for OAuth 2.0. Now, for us, we are going to use this request here. So this is an API where we can get a weather forecast or get the current weather. 
So I'll put that into the URL, and you can see that the way OpenWeather works is you have a app ID query string parameter, and that's followed by your API key at the end. So where that says your API key, you just replace it with the key that you have. Now I have a couple that I can use. So that is, that's the query string that I'm using. And when I send that request, I now get a weather forecast for the city of Sydney. But maybe we'll change that to something else. Sorry? So for this one, I've select, actually, I'll just keep it there. Um, for this one, I've selected no off because it doesn't, in the past, it wouldn't have matched any of these options here. We're just putting the query string at the end. But now, actually, another way we can do that is there is an API key option on the type. And you can see there, app ID followed by the value. And we simply append that to the query parameters. So I can get rid of that. I don't have to put it in there for every request. And that would work the same way. Whereas if I, if I remove that key and I try and send, you'll see that we say it says invalid API key. Yep. So the question is, would we recommend doing it this way with the API key or putting it onto the query string, correct? Ah, yes. I, so later on, we're going to build on this request and come back and put some variables in there instead. Um, the authorization tab, this API key method, this is useful if, let's say, for example, you have a number of requests for this open weather API. And instead of having to put um, and app ID on every single request along with your API key, you can simply define the API key here. And if you define this at the collection level, every request in that collection will use the same credentials. So it's up to you which method you, you use. On the instructions for the exercise, we go with the query string, because it's a little bit easier to, to write down. Um, but you can change it to what I've demonstrated if you want to as well. And if your API key doesn't work, let me know, because when you sign up, it takes around an hour or so for the API key to be active. So if, if your key doesn't work, I do have some alternatives for you. So you need a key? OK. Um, what I might do, I will put these two keys onto the GitHub file, and you can grab them from there. The reason I don't do this by default is because the, each free account has a limit of 60 requests per, second, uh, per minute. So if everyone uses the same key at the same time, we might hit that limit. All right, so if you need an API key, I've put two options down at the very bottom of that text file on my GitHub repository. So try those out. All right, everybody good? OK. Again, if anyone needs more time, please do let me know. So that was authorizing our API requests. And that's the module for creating and sending requests. So we've looked at using the request builder to define our request, along with its headers and parameters and the body of the request. We've seen the authorization helper and how that can help us specify our API credentials. We've seen the formatted JSON responses and also how to generate code snippets. Any questions on what we've gone through? OK. So now, let's put those requests into collections. So we're going to be creating collections, saving requests into them. I'll talk about. Um, defining authorization at the collection level as well, how we can use folders in them, and just the various things that we can do within a collection. So most of Postman's features depend on collections. If you're generating a mock server, that's dependent on a collection, or it'll create a collection for you. Running tests, that's done through your collections as well. Generating documentation, collaborating with your workspaces, you, you're actually sharing your collections through those workspaces. 
So you can create collections from scratch, or you can create them during the process of saving a request. When you create a collection, it is important that you write a good description for it for documentation purposes, because later on, if you do decide to generate documentation, it will be based on your collection and what you've basically configured there. So the description is what's going to show up on your documentation page. Same when we're saving a request into a collection. You can save into an existing one, or you can create a new collection during that process. And again, it is important to have a good request description because that will appear on your docs as well. So let's start by creating a new collection. So on the Collections tab here, I'll click New Collection. And we'll just give this a name, calling it RESTful Booker. Now, once I create this, I'm going to look for that very first request that I sent to that booking URL, and I'm going to save it into my collection. So let's call it RESTful Booker. And we'll just say this is a sample API for hotel bookings. So create that. So there's my collection. There's no request in there yet. I will use the history tab to find a request to put in there. So that's the very first one I sent. It was a get request to that booking endpoint. And what I do is I click on the Save button on the right-hand side. When you save a request, it is important to give it an effective name. And what I like to do is, on the name, just indicate what that request is going to do. So this request is to basically get a list of all our bookings. So I'll call it get all bookings. You can put a description in there, gets all the current bookings, returns list of booking ID. Down at the bottom, we select which collection we want to save the request into. You can see there's our RESTful Booker one. If you need to, you can create a new collection from here as well, but we don't need to do that just yet. So I'll choose my RESTful Booker collection, hit Save. And now if I expand, RESTful Booker, you can see there's the get all bookings requests. So anytime I need to look at this and run it again, I can just open it from here. I don't have to go and put in the URL again and do all that configuration. So that's exercise 3.1. Let's create that collection, save our request in there, and we'll build on that collection as we work through this chapter. So in the collection, we can also define authorization as well. And when you define authorization at the collection level, it means that the credentials that you specify will be used for every request in the collection. And you can define that by going to the collection. There's a little drop down there with the, that button with three dots. And if you go and edit the collection, you see that there's an authorization tab here. And we have the same options that we saw previously when we were defining API authorization for a request. So I could put my API key in here. And this, these credentials are used in every request in the collection. So that's useful if like, all your requests use the same collection, uh, use the same credentials. You don't have to go and define it on every single request. But it's important to note that individual requests can still have their own independent authorization details. So if you go and define at the auth at the collection level, and then you go and define um, authorization at the request level as well, the credentials you specify on the request will override what you have at the collection level. So what are the, the use cases for collections? You can organize your APIs into collections. Usually, I would say we have a single API is represented by a single collection. And then larger collections should be split into multiple collections, or at the very least, uh, organized into different folders. That changes a little bit with, that, with the new API feature in Postman. So now that you have APIs here, you can actually you define your API using the API feature, and then you can have multiple collections that belong to that API. How you structure that is up to what you're trying to do. So some people might have a reference collection that basically represents the entire API and all its various endpoints. And then you might have additional collections that represent individual test suites that you want to run um, with that for that API. 
So there's a lot of different ways we can organize. We can group our requests into folders. So when you start to get a lot of requests in a collection, it's useful to have folders in there. And a folder can represent a group of requests, which can be run either individually, um, sequentially, or even conditionally as well. So you can run all the requests in a collection, or you can run just the requests within a folder in that collection. There's a number of ways you might consider how to structure your folders. So you can organize based on related endpoints. So for example, all your booking endpoints go into one folder, or your auth endpoints go into another folder. You can organize by steps in a process. So you have like a folder to represent a particular sequence of tests, and all the, all the endpoints you need to hit in that test are in that folder. You can organize by common authorization. So if you've got different authorization credentials for different endpoints in your API, you can set up a folder for that. And you can also define authorization credentials at the folder level, just like what we saw with the collection level. Or you can organize by request method, or your get request in one folder, your post request in another folder, et cetera. So let's go and add some folders to our collection. We're going to add two folders, one called bookings and one called auth. And to do that, we go to that dropdown with more actions and add a folder. Bookings. And then do that one more time for auth. And you can drag and drop your requests around. So this get all bookings request, I'm going to drag and drop that into the bookings folder. And that goes underneath there. The other request that I want to have is we'll go and find that post request that we used earlier on, and we'll save it into the bookings folder as well, and we'll call it create new booking. So I'll go to the history, and there's the post request. So this one here I will save, call it create new booking. And when you scroll down here, you'll see that we've already selected our RESTful Booker collection because that was the last collection I selected when I saved the request. So now it's showing me the two folders that I have. I will select the bookings folder and save it there. Now if I go to my collections, I have two requests underneath that bookings folder. There are two slides to this exercise. Now next up, we want to create a new post request to a different endpoint. We want to use this auth endpoint here. And we're going to basically save this into our auth folder. So we'll start a new tab. Let me close that. So this endpoint that we're looking for is Exercise 3.2. So this is the endpoint, and this will be a post request. This request here is used to get an authentication token for this API. So on the body, we need to send some um, raw content, which is JSON. And oops, wrong button. This is the JSON string that we're sending in there. So we're basically providing a username and password. Now let's just send this request first to make sure it works. And you can see there on the response, I just get a token. So we want to save that into our auth folder. So hit save. And we'll call it get auth token. And down at the bottom, you can see we have the bookings folder selected by default because that was the last thing that I saved into. So let's go back up one level. So we click on bookings to go up one level again. And now I can see the auth folder. So I select that from there. And then I hit save. So now I've got get auth token underneath the auth folder. So by the end of this exercise, we'll have two folders and three requests in total in our collection. 
So have a go at that. Let me know if there's any questions.